Demos. Did you all hear me all right? I had a little trouble with this microphone. But I am absolutely delighted to welcome you here tonight for this discussion with Peter Dreyer and Bill Moyer of Peter's new book, The 100 Greatest Americans of the 20th Century, a Social Justice Hall of Fame. If you were a historian building this list of the top 100, you might choose a more diplomatic range of people. You have FDR, you might feel some pressure to have Ronald Reagan. Oh, God. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yes. But that is not Peter's list. Uh, as Peter will tell you, it is not a list for Bill O'Reilly or Rush Limbaugh, as he found out when appearing on Bill about the book. Uh, Peter profiles a much more colorful, progressive group of thinkers, activists, dreamers from Ellen Goodman, I'm sorry, Emma Goodman to Saul Alinsky to Michael Moore. You know, here at Demos, we talk a lot about the life cycle of ideas and about how in order to create the economy and the democracy that we all deserve and that works for all of us, that we need to think about big, bold ideas. Ideas that are on the horizon, the kind of things that we aspire to, our dreams, the kind of ideas that a lot of people in this book would hold. And I think perhaps that's why Peter kindly included two of our very own in the emerging leaders section of the book. And one is Heather McGee, who's here tonight. Stand up. Our Vice President of Policy and Outreach. And then also Tamara Drought, our Vice President of Policy and Research, who couldn't be here. But thank you, Peter. For the rest of you, when the 21st century version of this book comes out, Heather and Tamara will have eight-page full-color spreads, I promise. <laughs> so neither of our guests needs an introduction, but I will say, Peter Dreyer has been a community organizer, a journalist, a government official. He is now the E.P. Clapp Distinguished Professor of Politics and Director of the Urban and Environmental Policy Program at Occidental College. His work, advocacy, and writings regularly appear in The Nation, The American Prospect, The LA Times, Talking Points Memo, I think you get the idea. And I believe this is your fifth book. Bill Moyers has received 35 Emmy Awards for his contributions to journalism, and I would argue to the country. <laughs> he returned to television earlier this year with Moyers and Company, which is an incredible show, and actually where one of our senior fellows, Michael Winship, where are you Michael, back there, is a senior writer. I don't think it would surprise anyone that Bill is one of Peter's top 100 from the 20th century. And so to close out, I'll just tell you what Peter says. Peter writes, a gifted storyteller, Moyers roars with a combination of outrage and decency, exposing abuse and celebrating the country's history of activism. <coughs> Seems about right. I want to thank our partners, Nation Books, who also published Peter's book, and Jules Bernstein for making this evening possible. I want to ask all of you to turn your cell phones off right now. We'll have about 45 minutes of discussion, and I'm sorry, about half an hour of discussion and then about half an hour of Q&A. Please, please try to keep your questions short. We're <coughs> filming, and we are also trying to keep Bill on a tight schedule here so he can get out of here at 7.30. Uh, we will have a reception in the back afterward where you can buy more copies of Peter's book, and we'll sign them gladly. So thank you very much for coming out tonight, and please join me in welcoming Peter Dreyer and Bill Moyers. Thank you for that welcome. Thank you for that very generous introduction, and thanks everyone for, for, for being here, for coming out on an evening like this. I, I love Demos. I have been here before. We participated together in the conference on inequality that began to put the subject on Map, uh, and there are some very big ideas uh, being hatched here that I think will have an influence in the years to come over the shape of American politics and ideas. I'm pleased, delighted, and honored to be sharing this moment with Peter Dreyer. He is a one-man progressive movement. <laughs> I, I, I'm serious about that. If you look at 
the story of his life, you will see it in activism, public service, scholarship, organizing, uh, writing, thinking. He truly combines the life of a committed, principled man in the trenches, uh, not just in the theoretical work of building America. I don't know anyone uh, who more represents the commitment to fulfilling the promise of, of the preamble of this country to form a more perfect union and to fulfill uh, the vision of those radical founders who took seriously the promise of life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness, as well as to form a more perfect union. In, his, in the full body of his work, uh, he speaks to that aspiration of this country to be a place, as Gordon Wood says in his remarkable Pulitzer Prize winning book, uh, the, the Radical Nature of American History, uh, the American Revolution, belongs to the ordinary, uh, hitherto neglected and despised masses. Democracy is for those people, not for the plutocrats and the oligarchs. And Peter's life sums that up. And I'm both honored tentatively to be in this book. I'm sure when it comes out again, there'll be 99 uh, <laughs> Americans because I, it was a hoax to put me in there, but he, 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 he did it nonetheless. And I'm very honored and flattered. And I'm pleased to have this chance to be with him. I've seen him only once for any uh, spell when he asked me out to speak at Occidental College and what I discovered there was the contagion of this man that passed on and infected deeply the students who, with whom I spent time out there. That is, of course, the mark of a great teacher that, uh, that the students sitting under him are more than awed that they are inspired and moved to be involved in politics. He, he started, and in the life of democracy, he started a program out there that's still version of getting his students involved in political campaigns and elections. And that, of course, is where all of our aspirations and ideas and ideals for America are fought out in the give and take, the rough world, the tumble of electoral politics. He has his best students down in the trenches of democracy. I, I do need to ask you something that is the cause of an argument with a, a friend of mine. You had not come to Occidental when Barack Obama was a student there. No, I didn't know. That's why he left, I'm sure. <laughs> but there are some right-wing historians that still blame me for it. Yeah. <laughs> I, I can see that. Uh, you made reference to big, bold ideas. And I'll begin this evening by telling you the biggest and boldest idea I ever heard about America. And I used it in the closing of a conference this afternoon sponsored by Carnegie Corporation on Education in America. And uh, some professor, or some president of, of a university stood there and said, I've been here all day. I wasn't, I just got there for the afternoon. And I haven't heard a big, bold idea. So I said, let me tell you the biggest, boldest idea I ever heard about education and, and, and about Amer and America. It was 1964. I was too young for the assignment President Johnson had given me, but I attempted it. He asked me to organize the task forces uh, to create what became known as the Great Society, task forces on the environment, education, uh, poverty, all of those. And at, 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 at the age of 30, I did that with a lot of audacity and a lot of gumption and a lot of mistakes. But when we had organized the, four, the, the 14 task forces and assembled the 20 to 30 people who would be on each one on each of those task forces, I arranged for each task force to meet with the president. And so we had the, the 15 to 16 members of the education task force and they spent an hour with the president talking about what this task force was about, what we hoped to do. There was no office of education at that time, uh, the department of education. Uh, there was no educational elementary secondary education act which we passed a year later. We were really starting the effort to try to create a coherent uh, national agenda with education. And so the president answered a lot of questions and wasn't really ready for the last one. Some president of a university said, Mr. President, I want to ask you, you taught for a year in a very poor town in Texas. 
And uh, what did you learn from those students? It was an all Mexican uh, American uh, school. Many of the kids couldn't speak uh, Spanish, uh, English, so LBJ learned uh, uh, Spanish sufficiently to teach them. And many of those kids stayed in touch with him for the rest of his career. But he thought for a moment and he said, and this is the big bold idea, which I told these college presidents and foundation heads and others this afternoon. He said, what I, he said, what did you look to the president said, what did you look to the president Johnson? What did you learn from those kids? And LBJ said, I learned that what the richest American parent wants parents want for their kids, the poorest American parents want for their kids. And that, he said, goes back to the preamble. It goes back to the declaration. It means that America is a place where your fate and your destiny are not to be determined exclusively by the lottery of life. And I have an obligation as the president to try to close the gap between what the parents of the poorest kids want and the parents of the rich kids. But it's not me, he said. It's our government. It's the public. It's the American people who believe that. Now that was 44, 48 years ago, 1964. And we are not there yet. But that idea is at the heart of the progressive cause in this country. It is to close the gap between the richest and the poorest. You know that 1% of the American earners receive 93% of the income of the first full year of the recession. 93%. Not in our history has the income of the top one-tenth of 1% one been higher than it is today or their tax rates lower. We're going in the other direction from that big idea. But that big idea is what motivates Demos and is what motivates Peter Dreyer. So I'm very happy to be here to tell you how grateful I am for what you mean, not only to the progressive movement, but to the foundation of this country. It's well, thanks, to be here. So let's begin with a, with a serious question. This is not rehearsed. A number of my progressive friends, including some leading progressive historians, are arguing among themselves today that Barack Obama is not a progressive. He is a central liberal corporate, a central centrist corporate liberal. And they're actually having a serious online discussion that I'm a party to, but not a participant in, about whether or not it serves the progressive cause to vote for President Obama. Oh, that's ridiculous. Ridiculous, but serious. And I wonder how you wrestle with your progressive and even more, uh, more radical friends on this issue. Uh, well, my friends tell me that uh, they're not going to vote for Barack Obama, but not my friends. <laughs> but, uh, but, um, no, that, that, I'm joking, but uh, but I am serious about uh, the importance of the elected Barack Obama. But in terms of how it fits into this larger story of, of the book and the story that you've told in many of your speeches and writings, that all American progress over the last hundred or so years comes about when there are insiders and outsiders, and uh, the insiders are the politicians and the judges. Um, and including the presidents. There are three presidents in my book, uh, Theodore Roosevelt, Franklin Roosevelt, and, um, and Lyndon Johnson. And none of them welcome uh, being the targets of protest. And you know this. Um, I, I quote your story in the book about uh, Martin Luther King's meeting with LBJ. Maybe you can tell it obviously better than I can. Uh, there's that famous story, uh, which may be apocryphal, but I like to tell it anyway, about how a group of activists were meeting with Franklin Roosevelt um, in the Oval Office during the Depression, urging him to support uh, pro-labor legislation, and he listened to them intently for about a half an hour, and then he said, um, I agree with everything you said. Now go out and make me do it. <laughs> Which really meant, you know, I, it's easier for me to pass what I want to pass yeah. in, in Congress if there's people out in the streets making noise and protesting and putting pressure on the fact that the moderate Democrats uh, and some of the more moderate and somewhat liberal Republicans, which don't exist anymore. Um, and I think Mo and LBJ clearly understood that, as you've, as you've talked about. 
Uh, we all hope that this community organizer who became the president of the United States would have not only learned that lesson, but intended to be that kind of president. Um, and uh, when he uh, first got elected, uh, but before he took office, there was that famous sit-in in Chicago, where public windows and doors for 240 workers in this factory in Chicago, took over a factory when the owner said they were going to close it down. Um, and a reporter asked the president-elect, Obama, um, what did you think about what's going on in your hometown in Chicago, these 240 union workers are taking over the factory? And of course, he could have punted, he could have said, I don't know about it, or I'm too busy uh, thinking about my administration. Instead, he said, if I were them, I would do the same thing. And, uh, and so at that moment, a lot of us thought, oh, this is the kind of president we want. But as soon as he took office, he sort of hit the pause button. And so did the left who were, I think, seduced by being close to the president. Um, and when he proposed his first health, his health care reform, uh, some of his insider uh, 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 aides told the progressive groups like Healthcare for America Now, keep the protests off the, off the agenda, and let's work on the inside. We don't want to anger the moderate Democrats who we need for other pieces of legislation. And they took the advice until about a year later beginning around September of 2009, uh, nine months later, when uh, Healthcare for America now made a strategic decision to ramp up the protests and to um, uh, do uh, sit-ins at insurance companies and go to the CEO's houses of the big insurance companies and to talk and to have the victims of the insurance industry uh, get their voices heard. And I think uh, that gave the healthcare movement a second wind and that gave Obama a second win. And he began to talk like an activist, like a president that really wanted this. And Rahm Emanuel tried to talk him out of uh, pushing the health care. He said, no, we've got to do it. And so I think that regardless of whether he's a centrist or a liberal, he, like other politicians, respond to that kind of pressure. And I think we saw that after Occupy Wall Street, the famous speech he gave in Kansas. Uh, a year ago, in, in the last December, was in response to the growing concern in America about the rich and the widening gap between the rich and the poor. So I think that if Obama gets reelected, there will be a, a second wind below the surface in America right now, bubbling up. There's this movement waiting to happen. And I think if Obama is reelected, uh, they won't push the pause button this time. And they will immediately go into high gear. And I think that will make him a better president. Uh, and it'll make America better. I did an interview yesterday with uh, Neil Borofsky. It will run probably next week. But Neil Borofsky was a federal, a federal, a prosecutor in the Southern District Office here in, 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 in the District Attorney's Office here in uh, Manhattan when he was asked to be the Inspector General of the TARP program, the Trouble Assets Relief Program. And his job was to ferret out uh, fraud and waste. And he was a Democrat. He contributed to uh, Obama's campaign in 2008 because he, had, he said, I really believed in him and, I, and, and therefore I expected him to support our program. And he said, but he didn't. When push came to shove and we were trying to force, trying to win the argument over too big to fail, the White House not only failed to back them, but the White House cut the ground un uh, underneath us. And so I said, so how does this change your attitude toward the president? And he said, you know, having seen the president cave to the banks, to Geithner and to others, I cannot hope for it. To this old, 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 old director. And, and, and he went into detail about how the Obama White House, Rahm Emanuel, and the president Forwarded the efforts to serve the public interest in the bailout and the uh, and, and the reform movement, gutted Dodd Frank and so on. Uh, what must progressives do to be taken seriously? Well, there's, there's I think there's two ways to answer that question. One is to remind everybody that the the enemy of the liberals and progressives in this country is not the president. Chamber of Commerce, and the uh, Koch Brothers, and the Tea Party, and ALEC, uh, and uh, the Wall Street banks. Um, and they have too much power. Um, and, uh, and I think that the, 
the progressive movement uh, was thwarted in a lot of ways during the bailout discussions and the, the foreclosure discussions. Four million Americans have lost their homes. Fifteen million American homeowners <coughs> me, are underwater right now. You'd think there'd be this massive protest you know, on, from the streets. Um, and uh, that, that gets me to ask the question, you know, where is ACORN now that we need it? <laughs> um, and uh, my friend John Atlas is here. He wrote a book about ACORN called Seeds of Change. Um, but there are groups around the country right now that are taking up the, the energy that ACORN's demise, uh, the vacuum uh, that ACORN's demise left in its wake. Uh, a group in California called the Alliance of uh, Californians for Community Empowerment, it's called ACE. Um, Two years ago, they tried to get a bill through the California State Legislature called the Homeowner, Homeowner Bill of Rights. And uh, it got nowhere, even with the Democratic Legislature, it got nowhere. Uh, and it was to basically make it harder for banks to foreclose on people and to evict them. Uh, since then, particularly after Occupy Wall Street, ACE, SCIU, a National People's Action, which is another community organizing group, uh, PICO, which is a faith-based organizing, community organizing group, They've been mobilizing homeowners all over California, and some of this is happening in other states as well, to stop, to resist foreclosures, to, um, to tell the sheriffs we won't leave when the sheriff comes to, to um, evict us, to go to the CEO's house, of, uh, the bank's uh, CEO's, and go to their houses, their billion dollar houses, and, uh, and protest in front of them. And uh, three weeks ago, Governor Jerry Brown signed the Homeowner Bill of Rights. Uh, after Acorn and these, uh, sorry, ACE and these other groups got it through the state legislature. So what that tells me is that there is a new mood in the country. I think Occupy Wall Street had something to do with it. I have a lot of criticisms about their, their ability to organize. But they did change the mood of the country. All the polls show that Americans, including Republicans, are angry at too much corporate power. They're angry at the widening gap between the rich and the poor. And also that uh, most Americans believe that the banks uh, have ripped us off. Um, and so, you know, in the Depression, there were farmers taking over uh, farms uh, when they were being foreclosed on. There were tenants fighting, uh, resisting being evicted. And I think that uh, we will see more of that in the next year or two. I think that it's, it takes a while to, to bubble up below the surface. But Cal if California is any indication, uh, the mood of the country is ready for that kind of protest to make the president and Congress and our state legislators uh, more accountable. Do you see the difference between the progressive and the liberal as mainly rhetorical? Uh, or is there a substantive difference today? If people say, well, liberals were intimidated into mm -hmm. giving up the discolored use of that name right. by the right way. Right. And so we've come up with progressive to indicate a, a, a modern invention of progress of, of, of liberal. Is there more to it than that? Well, there is, but it's also a matter of, of context and history. Uh, so in 1900, if you were to uh, talk about women's right to vote, or social security, or the eight-hour day, or the 40-hour week, or laws protecting the environment, or consumers, or workplace safety laws, or the right of workers to unionize, you would have been called a communist, a socialist, an impractical dreamer, a utopian. People thought you were crazy. In 1911, Victor Berger, the first socialist congressman in the United States from Milwaukee, introduced the first social security legislation, old age insurance. And it went nowhere. You know, the Depression happens. Franklin Roosevelt and the New Deal introduces Social Security. It helped, and this is another difference with Obama and FDR. Uh, FDR had uh, Francis Perkins and Henry Wallace and people like that advising him in the White House, keeping him aware of the protests that were happening in the streets. Um, and so Social Security passed, and according to the Pew uh, survey, about 75% of Tea Party supporters believe that Social Security is, is sacred, should not be touched. Right? So is Social Security a radical idea? Is it a progressive idea? Is it a liberal idea? Or is it a conservative idea? It's, you know, it's, it's now common sense. And so I think there is a difference between liberal re incremental reforms and progressive and radical attempts to reshape society. To, uh, to widen, uh, to, to narrow the divide between the rich and the poor, to uh, 
to, uh, to make what we call structural changes in our economy. Uh, and not just, uh, not just make capitalism more humane, but to, to make capitalism more like they have in, in, in uh, Scandinavia, more of a social democracy. So I think there are differences, but over time, the, one of the themes of my book is the radical ideas of one generation are often the common sense of the next. So um, what's radical in one period of history can be much more uh, moderate or even conservative in the next, but it's still a good idea. What's your explanation for why, despite all of the efforts that have been made, the, it, the inequality gap is greater today than it has been in your lifetime and mine? I think the underlying reason is the weakness of the labor movement. Harold Meyerson has an incredible article in the current issue of uh, the American Prospect about what would America be like if there were no labor movement. Uh, the labor movement gave us the weekend. The labor movement brought us the middle class. Walter Luther is one of the people in my book, and he's probably more responsible for lifting more Americans uh, into the middle class than anyone, not just auto workers, but all Americans, or many Americans. Uh, and uh, if, uh, if there's one, I think if there were three things that would make America a more progressive society. One would be labor law reform, uh, in particular making the penalties for corporations that violate labor law and make, make it hard for people to, uh, uh, to unionize. According to all the polls, about half of all workers would like to see a union in the workplace, but only 10% of them, 11% of Americans are now unionized because they're afraid. So I think that's a major, uh, major cause of widening inequality. And, uh, uh, and Harold talks about that in his article. Uh, a second reform would be what you're going to be an advocate for, which is public financing of elections, which would give corporations less power and narrow the gap between the rich and the poor in terms of tax rates. And the third, um, third would be uh, what Demos is very active on, which is election, election reform, same-day voter registration, making elections a national holiday, if those three things happen, the progressive movement, would, would, that would be the wind beneath their sails, and the gap between the rich and the poor, and the outrageous, you know, 50 million people in American poverty, just outrageous, that would, that would decline. <coughs> Michael Winship and I discovered this week. Michael, stand up. Michael is the senior writer from Warriors and Company and a senior fellow at Demos and uh, President of the Labor Union, uh, uh, the Writers Guild East, and my kindred, Soul and Spirit. We discovered this week, thanks to a young labor reporter for In These Times magazine, that Citizens United uh, may have empowered corporations with the right to tell their employees how to vote and, and who to vote for. We had that confirmed by Trevor Potter, who is, was John McCain's uh, finance director in two campaigns, 2000 and 2008, for the presidency, who has been so dismayed, disgusted, and, and uh, frustrated by the political system that, that, that money in politics, he started an organization called the National Legal Center to try to cope with this massive money. And he confirmed for us today, watch Warriors and Company this week, by the way, the subject this week is Plutocrats, oh. and uh, it's, a, it's a fascinating book by Christia Freeland, who uh, worked with the, the Economist and, and the Financial Times, uh, and is now the editor of Thompson Reuters Digital. Uh, uh, she's really done a definitive work on plutocracy and inequality. So watch that uh, this week. In my judgment, uh, Michael and I were talking about this in the cab coming down here, our political system is no longer legitimate. It cannot be legitimate in a democracy when vast sums of secret money by political assassins are flowing into the process so that there is no accountability. Two and a half million dollars from a single secret group going into the campaign this week against Tammy Duckworth in Wisconsin. Uh, we don't know where it's coming from. We don't know who's behind it. So the voters of Wisconsin will never know who owns Tommy Thompson if they if he wins. And I think that has removed the legit we still have no option but to participate in the vote, but I do not believe it is I believe it's a fraudulent system now in terms of serving uh, the, 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 the democracy and, and the country. Do you ever get that feeling? Uh, I, try, I try to resist getting that feeling because then it's hard to get up in the morning. 
Um, in California right now, we have a Proposition 32, which was put on the ballot by um, by right-wing Republicans to basically destroy the labor movement. It's it's uh, it's called a, uh, a campaign finance, but it really what it does is it uh, it eliminates the ability of unions to give money to, camp to uh, politicians, and, uh, but it doesn't do anything uh, for, for real estate trusts, billionaires, super PACs. So it's really um, not campaign finance, it's a corporate power grab. And if they pass that in California, right now the polls are pretty close, if they pass that in California, they will uh, take that on the road and it'll be, uh, they'll take it to all the major states where unions are, are still a political influence. Uh, and so, uh, there's a huge uh, political effort to try to stop that. Um, and uh, the Koch brothers gave $4 million to, uh, to this campaign. But we don't know where some of the money, like you just said, we don't know where some of the money is for this pro Prop 32 campaign because of the way our campaign finance laws um, are organized. But you know, because you've been one of the strongest advocates of public financing, that the public is outraged by this you know, this, this attempt to 75 percent of the most recent polls in America's world to change yeah. it. So you know, any politician that campaigns on a platform of changing the campaign finance laws should be able to uh, to, to draw a lot of support. But we need the grassroots to make it more uh, politically feasible. In your judgment. What follows if Romney wins? Oh, God. Um, what follows is um, massive cuts to social programs, including public, public education, um, tax breaks for the rich. Um, the first appointment of the Supreme Court will clearly have a, a witness test, and Roe versus Wade will be history. Yeah. Um, I hope Ruth Bader Ginsburg can live uh, four years. Uh, if she it, doesn't, yeah. she won't reveal it. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> and um, uh, uh, you know, she's uh, she's withholding. Uh, if, if, if if Romney wins, she's the difference between ending women's right to choose. Um, and there will you know be a massive buildup of the military, um, and uh, it'll it'll be it'll be an awful situation. And I was asked this question. Uh, I was on Tavis Smiley's show last week, a couple days ago, and he said, aren't there any redeeming qualities to, uh, to Romney and, no. uh, and Ryan? Because he says Ryan is talking about poverty. And I said, yeah, he's talking about more people being in poverty, uh, which is what the consequence will be. I mean, if they try to, uh, I can't believe they will actually be able to carry out uh, the budget plan because the Democrats will stop them from doing it. But there are lots of things the president can do without going through Congress, and uh, it'll just be awful. But I, you know, uh, when I get up in the morning uh, uh, and I look at the polls, I'm this morning, I'm uh, pretty, pretty confident that uh, that scenario won't happen. The poll I saw this morning, the latest Gallup poll, and I don't believe in polls, yes. even though we use them extensively when I was in the Kennedy Johnson administration. But I was 14 years old when. Uh, Thomas Dewey was elected president of the <laughs> And that it has informed my life. Uh, the, the latest Gallup poll I saw, saw showed uh, Romney up 51-46 over Obama nationally and leading in most, if not all, of the 12 competitive states. So maybe that's one reason not to read the polls, but but I agree with you. I have a different poll. Yeah, that's <laughs> a different poll. Peter, uh, I got a copy of this for each one of my three grown uh, grandchildren because they wrestle with these questions we've been talking about and they need some nurturing and they need some inspiration they need to get up in the morning and I so I assigned them the task of not the task the joy of reading a chapter a day in here I had a teacher in Marshall High School who once responded to a kid who said Mr. Brucey this is not fun and she <laughs> said Jack Learning is supposed to be hard. It's not fun. Uh -huh. Of course it is fun. This is both learning and fun. So I have to ask, one of my favorite chapters in here is about Dr. Seuss. Why did you put Dr. Seuss in here? <laughs> well, the book has three different kinds of people. There are people that I call organizers and activists. You know, the, uh, the Jane Addams and the, 
um, the Rose Schneidermans and the uh, A. Philip Randolphs and uh, the Ella Bakers. And then there are uh, politicians, uh, about a third, about almost a third of the people in the book are either elected officials or people that ran for office and didn't make it, like Eugene Debs, uh, or, uh, or Supreme Court justices. Um, and the, th the third group are thinkers, writers, cartoonists, uh, photographers like the Lewis Hine, the great photographer of the turn of the century who helped to expose the, the uh, outrage of child labor, uh, and, uh, and novelists and playwrights. And Dr. Seuss, uh, many people don't know, his real name is Theodore Geisel, was uh, first an uh, editorial cartoonist for the left-wing newspaper here in New York called PM yeah. in the 1940s. Um, and it's, it, you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's a newspaper that most people don't even know existed, but it, it nurtured a lot of great people, including I.F. Stone. Who oh, interesting. Them. Um, and then when he started writing children's books, his left-wing politics obviously came into the writing. And so uh, not all of his books can you find a hidden meaning, but uh, the ones that I read to my children that I remember and still enjoy, Girl the Turtle, <laughs> is about Hitler. It's about, Dr. Seuss once said, I don't like people that push other people around. That's just sort of underlying philosophy. And Euro the Turtle is about this turtle who abuses the other turtles until Max, the turtle on the bottom, uh, revolts and organizes a movement to, uh, to overthrow Euro. Uh, and he comes tumbling down and becomes just an ordinary turtle. Um, and uh, the Butter Battle book is a book about the Cold War and about the arms race. It's about two sides on a fence uh, of groups of people trying to uh, find weapons to kill the other, weapons of mass destruction against each other. And that's clearly Dr. Seuss's uh, uh, criticism of the arms race. The Lorax, which is now a movie, is about corporate abuse of the environment. The Speeches is about anti-Semitism. Right? And so lots of great Dr. Seuss stories uh, have a, a hidden meaning. And so if he's the, he's the uh, most um, well-known and widely read children's uh, writer in the history of the world, more than Aesop's Fables, more than uh, the, the Brothers Grimm. And uh, what most people don't know is they're getting a dose of left-wing propaganda <laughs> while their kids are learning vocabulary words. Well, I, I'll settle for that till we get our own Fox News. Okay. <laughs> we produce our television program. My wife is my partner, creative partner as well. We produce it because we consider it something of a campfire. And we can imagine people coming out of the shadows all over the country, out of the darkness, and sitting around for an hour and then going back and talking about the people and the ideas they, they've sensed there. And many people have stopped me and said, I don't feel as lonely after watching that broadcast. When I read the galleys of your book, which you so graciously sent me, I had the sense of being part of a procession a long train that goes all the way back to the beginning. Uh, uh, and, and, and I felt much less thwarted by the defeats of the moment and could sense that we might drop the baton at this moment, but that had been passed to us by all these people and somebody would pick it up and carry it on to the next generation. I really do believe that, which is what keeps me going. But I was touched by your inclusion in here of Miles Horton. I did two hours with Miles Horton on television many years ago when we used to still get that kind of airtime. And Paul Wellstone subsequently told me that he watched that program. Wow. And that's why he got into politics wow. after having been a professor for so long. That what Miles Horton said made him want to not be a theorist of politics, but a practitioner. Politics. So tell us briefly who Miles Horton was and why you have him in here. Miles Horton was the founder of something called the Highlander Folk School, which is now called the Highlander Center in Tennessee. And it was a training center for activists, starting with the labor movement in the 30s and then with the civil rights movement. And you know, there's a lot of great stories that come out of the Highlander School. One of them is that uh, a group of uh, African-American tobacco workers were uh, at a workshop at the Highlander School on labor organizing, and uh, Pete Seeger happened to be there, along with another guy named Guy Caroline, who is uh, the, uh, the cultural director of the Highlander School, who, by the way, went to Occidental College. <laughs> and um, and they, heard them, they heard these African-American 
um, uh, tobacco workers singing this song called I Will Overcome Someday. Uh, and Pete Seeger and Guy Caroline listened to it. They changed the tune a little bit. They made it a little faster. Uh, they sped it up. They changed uh, I Will Overcome to We Shall Overcome. And that's the origins of the song We Shall Overcome. And then Guy Caroline taught it to the students at SNCC and it became the anthem of the Civil Rights Movement. Rosa Parks went to a workshop at the Highlander Center a few months before she made that uh, important move of not going to the back of the bus. And she said in her autobiography that being, it was, it was racially integrated, which in Tennessee in the 1940s and 50s was you know, outrageous. Um, and they were often closed down by the, by the police for having integrated meetings. Rosa Parks said it was the first time she'd ever been uh, at a setting where whites and blacks were on equal footing and that she actually said that uh, a white person served me food, served me breakfast. <laughs> so that had never happened before. And that gave her a sense that an integrated society was possible. And when she got on that bus that day, um, she'd been a long time activist. She wasn't just a tired woman. But she said she remembered that moment at the Highlander School. And so the Highlander School was one of a number of training centers for organizers, but one that had an enormous impact on the, on the history of the Civil Rights Movement and the Labor Movement. Uh, there are programs like that today, like the Midwest Academy in Chicago to train organizers, but it's really the first and, the, and, and, and probably the most important of all the training programs and training centers. And it's still going on doing work on immigrant rights and environmental justice. They just celebrated their 80th birthday. And Miles Horton was the one that had that idea uh, based on his experience as a student at Union Theological Seminary here. And then he went to Denmark and he learned about something called the Danish Workers' Folk Schools. And he brought that idea back here. Paul Wellstone is, is in Peter's book. Some of you will remember that he was the pro most progressive member of the Absolutely. city. Uh, died tragically in a crash just a few days before the election. Uh, ten years ago, and ten years ago last week, he stood on the floor of the Senate and made the most moving, powerful speech against the Iraq resolution to go to war in Iraq. If you want to feel both a, a, a mournful sense of loss and a triumphant sense of a life well lived and an example for all of us, go to YouTube, get the four and a half, six minute uh, excerpt of that speech uh, when you get home this evening. And, and, and look at it uh, and know that that spirit uh, is, is alive and well. Actually, the best part of this book is picking it up every morning and reading that it says Bill Moyers 1934 dash. <laughs> 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 There's another thing there, and I'm happy a, a book. And many more. It, it's a wonderful uh, book, and we could talk all night. Uh, about it. I'm, I'm going to tell you the story that Peter includes in here that had, had been well told before he asked me about it, but it's succinctly said it's uh, when Lyndon Johnson, as president, decided to try to persuade Martin Luther King not to hold his first marches in 1960, late 64, 65. And because he said, you know, if he just gives me a chance, I can persuade the southern barons, the titans of the Senate who've been conducting these filibusters against civil rights and preventing any civil rights action, I can bring them along. I, I never expected to be president, but I am now, and I've got instruments at my control that I, and, and friendships I can invoke, and I can get it done if he will just not take to the streets. Because if he takes to the streets, it will only get their back up. It will only, uh, res uh, force them in public to defend the white supremacy cause, but I can persuade them quietly and effectively to come around. Well, that was a miss, uh, miss that was a, a wrong idea, as he later admitted. <laughs> but he called Martin Luther King to the White House and tried to persuade him to hold off on the marches. And he asked for it. He said, you know, just give me a little longer. And Martin Luther King said, in effect, we've given you 250 years, <laughs> and we still aren't there. And then after listening to the president for 30, 40 minutes, make a very persuasive case. And as you, some of you know from reputation, and some of you have read, Lyndon Johnson was the great persuader when he was in a one-on-one -on -one situation with anyone. Uh, Martin Luther King listened uh, respectfully, uh, patiently. And then 
he made the case about why he couldn't wait, including the fact that 250 years had gone by and still no justice for African Americans. And he made such a case that when the meeting was over and they got up to leave to walk out of the Oval Office, LBJ, the president, put his arm on Dr. King's shoulder and said, all right, Dr. King, go back out there and make it possible for me to do the right thing. In other words, build the climate, build public opinion, keep the fire burning, and, uh, and, and give me what I need to say this is not just Lyndon Johnson. This is the majority of the American people who want justice for their black brothers and sisters. But that, I think, is why you included that story, and that is still the mandate of people who believe in seriously fulfilling the promise of America. No one has made a greater contribution uh, to that effort from various venues than Peter Dreyer. And if you want to be charged and recharged, if you want to be inspired and informed, read one of these every day as I did and as my grandchildren are, and be grateful that we are all part of that great train that runs from the radical beginnings of the American Revolution, as Gordon Wood described them, to where we are headed, if there is, in fact, as I believe there is, an arc of justice in human history. Peter, thank you very much. I've taken too long, and I did so. I, did so I still have another event this evening. We finished the show today. I had the afternoon at Carnegie's Education Conference, and I have an 8 o'clock meeting. And I was going to open the questions to you. I will do so for 10 minutes, and then, and, and then you can continue to, to talk here about this. But while I'm here, are there two or three questions to the two of us? Yes. Um, first of all, I think that Gallup Cole is an outlier. I've read other polls. Krista Freeland had a terrific article in News of the Week in Review on Saturday, Sunday, which I suggest people read. But the one question I'd like to ask, we all know that Barack Obama was open to a grand bargain to cut entitlements, and it failed because Biden couldn't reach, um, couldn't get his people to raise, uh, to cut tax, to raise taxes on the wealthy. Now I understand that if he, if Obama is reelected, he wants to do the same thing, reach out to cut entitlements to get a green, grand bargain. What would you say, or Lyndon Johnson say, to Barack Obama to prevent him for, to engaging in such treasonous behavior? I don't know because it's a hypothetical situation, but I think if he were here, he would say to him, uh, keep your options open, but never betray the people who need you most. And uh, if he does that, uh, Barack Obama uh, would not make a bargain that would hurt the people who need who deserve who, who own Social Security and who deserve Medicare and Medicaid. We don't know what Obama's going to do. I suspect that that there will be a bargain and that we won't like it. And if there is, it has to be stopped, as Peter said. He has to be, if he were to go that way, he has to learn the hard way that he can't do it. And if he does it, his presidency is finished. That not only will the riot thwart him from Congress, but that his base will thwart him in the streets. And it will just be the beginning of a start of a, of a progression to eliminate the social safety net, which Republicans wanted to. Well, remember, he wants, yeah, beginning on January of, of uh, next year, he's going to be thinking about his legacy. And, he, you know, and, and uh, his, most of his career has been a progressive. And I think that he's not going to want to look back or have historians or our grandchildren look back and think that, you know, his, uh, his presidency was uh, the grand bargain with the Republicans. A question on a different tack. Can, can the progressives explain to the wealthy that by making the society so unequal, they're actually killing the golden goose? And if they end up living in a country like like the Dominican Republic or Russia in the worst days, that that's not where they want to live either. My broadcast this weekend, is, the question is, can anybody explain to the, can the progressives explain to the plutocrats that 
they're killing the goose that laid the golden egg and that if they try to live in an America that is so unequal, it will not be a pleasant place to live. My interview this weekend on Morris and Company is with uh, Christa, Christia Freeland, who's written this uh, very good new book called Plut The Plutocrat, and Matt Taibbi uh, of Rolling Stone, who writes very vividly and strongly about the, the, the Plutocrats. And I asked them that question. And their answer is, these, this, these new rich are not like the old rich. The new rich, Mitt Romney's father, lived in Detroit, cared about Detroit, wanted to save the Detroit, uh, uh, the town, the city of Detroit. They had a connection to the community, a connection to the local bank, a connection to the local institutions, and they had a sense of obligation for what they had and to those who did. The new rich, Freeland and Taibbi, both say, and by the way, they knew each other as young reporters in Russia in the mid-90s, and they write very effectively about the Russian oligarchs and compare them to the American billionaires. The main difference between the Russian oligarchs and the American billionaires is that the American billionaires haven't knowingly killed anyone. Uh, the, uh, assassination is a common instrument among Russian oligarchs. Uh, it works in different ways in this country. But they say they're probably incapable of hearing the argument you would make because they now live in a world that is removed from the roots of American life and from the roots of their wealth. Their wealth is not from local communities. Their wealth is from the global economy and it has no personal attachment uh, to it. So I don't think progressives can make that case. Both Freeland and um, Taibbi say that they, ironically, they are going to destroy the system that has made them by this excessive imbalance. It's not even excessive, it's, it's preposterous, uh, the, the, the imbalance. If you walk out of our office on West 57, 250 West 57, and turn right toward Carnegie Hall, you will see rising there uh, the most luxurious and expensive apartment building to be built in this country. It's, uh, it's going to be the tallest residence in uh, New York City. And, uh, Two apartments have already are already under contract for ninety million dollars, and two, the the more moderate apartments are going for forty five to fifty five million dollars. It's just a few blocks away from where Sanford, Sandy Weil, who manipulated the death of Glass Steagall, the uh, important firewall against what has happened in two thousand eight, sold his apartment in at fifteen Central Park West. For 15 to for 90 million dollars to the dog to a Russian oligarch whose daughter wants to use it when she's in town. In time, in time. Now you, you can't create a middle as you know the New York of the 25 largest cities in America. New York is now the most unequal. The the, the median income of the bottom 20 percent uh, last year was nine thousand dollars, and the average income. Uh, at the top was 2.7 or 2.2 or 2.7 million dollars. A civilization can't survive that kind of inequity. It's like putting four people on the bow of the Titanic and 600 at, 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 at on the stern. It, it goes like this and, and too many people fall out for it to be an inhabitable uh, in, in, in environment. This is either going to come apart from its own excesses or we are going to overcome our apathy and our angst and act in sustained ways to remedy the desperate situation. Yes? Why don't enough people see it, it seems to me? They don't understand it and they vote against their interests. I mean, we will implode. We have the seeds of our own destruction and we're doing it right now. But very few people see it. That's the last question before we run out of time, so who do you take it? Well, the polls show that people do see that people are angry about the white inequality, that people are angry about the power of big business. Um, but it doesn't mean, and remember, half the people don't vote, right? So, and, uh, and given the voter suppression that the Republican Party has been engaged in this in the last couple months, I mean, you know, unless something dramatic happens, even fewer people will vote. But the, you know, if, if uh, the majority of the population that doesn't vote went to the polls, the outcomes of the, of the elections would be very different. That's one thing. 
And the other thing is that you know my book is filled with stories of people that were called traitors to their class. You know, in every society, in every generation, there are people from the, the from the plutocratic uh, uh, upbringing, uh, or people who made a lot of money on their own, understand that the the gap between the rich and the poor is getting out of hand. Uh, the first person in my book is Tom Johnson, the progressive mayor of, of Cleveland. Um, and he was, a, a, in today's terms, a billionaire. Uh, and he said, I understand how the, uh, how the rich uh, corrupt our politics, because I was one of them. And he became the progressive mayor of Cleveland. And there are people like that in our society who overcome uh, the uh, disadvantages of being a billionaire uh, and, and, and see through it. Um, but we can't depend on that to, to bring about progressive politics. We have to depend on ordinary people understanding and, and being mobilized. And there are a lot of people in this room who have spent a lot of their lives mobilizing people for political action. And I, I believe that's going to continue and it's going to explode. I really do believe there's going to be a, a huge, uh, a huge uh, upsurge of activism uh, if the president gets reelected. One of the reasons, of course, for the passivity, it's not apathy, but it is passivity, is that the poor are demoralized. And as Matt Taibbi says in the broadcast this week, it's not only because the bills keep coming and they have no means to pay them, it's because life for them it wears them down. He tells of having been in Queens two nights ago, three nights ago, I guess, and talk, interviewing a young man, 23 years old, who's been stopped and frisked 70 times. 70 times. And how that kid uh, can continue to get up in the morning and brave the streets, look for a job, and fulfill his civic obligations is, 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 is a mystery. I mean, it, we're not there yet, but the tender is, uh, is ready. And, and it could go either way. It could go violently or it could go politically. And uh, I don't know that I'll be around to see it, but some of you will, and hopefully some of you will be um, in that part of the procession. I apologize for having to go. I made a commitment to the 8 o'clock event before Peter was coming to town, and we, to the other event, well, and I'd rather stay around and call politics with you all. There are moments when I regret not being a billionaire, and uh, one of them is <laughs> now, because I would like to buy copy of that book and give it to each one of you. But I'm going to trust you to do that as you may. And uh, mainstream politics, electoral politics. You gave examples of presidents who urged people to uh, put pressure on them. And other example in California where there's been some success with the putting pressure on the legislative process. There are also examples of movements that have been co-opted by the involvement of uh, of mainstream political people. Um, and there's also, I think, a perception that the right has been better or more effective at uh, focusing on political uh, objectives and electoral gains than the left. And I just wonder if you could sort of comment on the, 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 the sort of uh, this unhappy or uneasy relationship between uh, progressive movements and, and uh, uh, so um, I'm going to say something probably heretical. I think co-optation is a good thing. In my class uh, two weeks ago, uh, my students and I went over the 1912 platform of the Socialist Party. Almost everything in that platform is now a matter of law and common sense. The eight-hour day, the woman's right to vote, the workers' right to unionize, some of the things I mentioned earlier. Not all of them. Right. The nationalization of major industry, that didn't quite happen, <laughs> right? But the, but the uh, municipal ownership of utilities, you know, every day I wake up in Los Angeles and I turn on my light, and that's from the Department of Water and Power, uh, which is a public agency. And so um, I, think, I think that uh, uh, it's good to be co-opted. I think that what left uh, activists want is for mainstream politicians to feel enough pressure that they steal their ideas and then they water them down a little bit. Well, that's okay. Because, you know, the, the history of progressive gangs in this country is not things happening overnight, but things incrementally change and evolve. Right? As I said, it was 1911 when Victor Berger first initiated the, you know, the proposed the Social Security law. That took 20 years, 25 years later for that to happen. Um, and there, there is this tension between electoral politics 
and movement building in some ways because uh, it depends on what you do when you get up in the morning. Uh, are you involved in protests? Are you involved in uh, door knocking? Are you involved in uh, trying to get people organized uh, in their workplaces? Or are you working for a political campaign and working uh, and donating your money to a candidate? But I do think there's also this symbiotic relationship. And Francis Fox Pivot in her book, Poor People's Movement, so we did clarity, talks about this. That you know, electoral change and public policy come about when movements are, 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 are rising. And, and as, as I've said earlier, as Bill talked about. And so I don't see any contradiction between those two. Michael Harrington, the great um, writer of the man who wrote The Other America 50 years ago, which helped inspire the war on poverty, uh, he once said that if you're going to be a progressive activist, you have to be a long distance runner and not a sprinter. You can't expect things to happen overnight. So I, I, I think that uh, if we have that perspective, then each election and each legislative session can bring some incremental changes. Uh, but, but the other part of your question, I, I think, is important. The Tea Party understands that better than the left. The Tea Party has held the right wing, the, the Republican Party, uh, accountable. They've done a great job of pushing the Republican Party to the right. I don't think it's great for the country, but it's great for their uh, ideology. And uh, you know, we do that sometimes, but we're you know we're we're, we're not as uh, we're not as well organized. We're not as clear about our objectives. As uh, the Tea Party and the right. Of course, the right has no money. They have their own brothers. Just a few more. Go ahead. Um, being in voting in New York, I feel that I want to send Obama a message by not voting for him because I'm one of those progressives that was very disappointed like in his mm -hmm. third month. Um, is that not a good idea? I mean, you're saying, it, yeah. if I was in the swing state, I would probably vote for Obama just because I'm voting against Romney. But what do you feel about, you know, I think it's a it's, it's, it's a false sense of possibility to think that Jill Stein is going to be a player in American politics and then for the Green Party. It just doesn't work out that way. Given the nature of our two-party system, the Electoral College, it's just, it just it isn't a viable option. Right? So to encourage her, right, just like you know people who voted for Ralph Nader, I think there's a huge mistake. Ralph Nader, Absolutely. You know, um, I think to encourage the Green Party that way is a mistake. Right? But uh, but there's something there's something more fundamental to your question, which is um, there have been incredible achievements during the first Obama administration. We're, our grandchildren are going to look back at this health care bill and say this was the opening wedge towards universal health insurance. And then you know, I, that's a good example of this incremental. You know, long distance runner idea. This this was a, a milestone of American politics. If it's not repealed, you know, and and if right, and if uh, Romney and uh, Ryan are elected, it may be repealed or it'll be watered down, or a Supreme Court will be will appoint a Supreme Court, which will change the the Supreme Court decision from earlier this year. And so I think that the health care bill, my students don't even realize, Carl might realize, but um, some of my other students may not realize. That there are, um, uh, that they are more likely to have financial aid, right? financial assistance because of Obama's reforms um, and the Lenny Ledbetter Act. I mean, there's a long. I think the, the biggest problem with Obama is he has, he has been a terrible salesman for his own accomplishments. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I hope I hope he learns that lesson in the second term. So I think both of your premises that you know. Yes, we're all a bit disappointed, but we ought to look in the mirror and not look at Obama. Also, if the numbers are like just a tiny bit for Jill Stein, won't that send Obama a message? No, no, no. 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 I'm not no. like more no. no. because he's, he also said push me to do it. But that's a couple. I don't think. I don't, don't, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't think see any that argument that makes no, sense. Not a bit. That does a few thousand votes. Or even a few hundred thousand votes from Jill Stein will change the direction of anything Obama does. Okay, a couple more. Well, you're in, you're in, how about somebody in the back? Go ahead, talk, talk louder. Thank you for approving the presentation. My pleasure. I work on these issues with the UN NGO community. And why is there so little discussion 
but why we seem to be screaming at each other, but not talking about why is the conservatives around the country counter-revolution being so successful since Gingrich, which is the block which uh, Clinton, I think, endorsed his position of government high position, a very cautious position, and nobody really spoke up for the blue boys. Handouts. There was something about uh, stress, and why is there so little discussion about uh, the politics of uh, the environmental issues? I presume most people at least believe in science and the critical importance uh, to the wealthy as well of so climate change and the need to engage with certain innovation to take different innovative positions. Of so when, when I was growing up, you ate a candy bar, you opened the window of your car, you threw it out. My students would think that, that was an outrage. And most Americans now would think that. Most of us recycle. Most of us understand about the importance of limited resources. Barry Commoner, who died a few weeks ago, wrote this book called The Poverty of Power. Uh, which is considered an incredibly radical book. It still is a radical book, but many of the ideas in that book are now things that all of us accept, not just the progressives, as, as normal. There's a small group of nutcases that believe global warming uh, doesn't exist. Well, unfortunately, some of them have some political power, right? but it's, it's not like most Americans don't accept the, uh, the basic underlying principles of the environmental movement, the Sierra Club, Greenpeace, you know, the range of the range. They may disagree with the tactics, it's like, you know, most Americans don't agree with the Occupy Wall Street tactics, but they agree with their message. Uh, and all the polls show that that's true. And so I think that um, it's not a question of what Americans believe. It's a question of whether we get off our asses to do something about it. And, you know, the thing that gives me hope, and I think we should end on, on this, but the thing that gives me hope the most is it, throughout the book, I talk about, you know, moments in history when things look Awful. You know, there's a famous Woody Allen story, you know, uh, his speech to the, to the, the graduate class. American can go two direct, directions. You know, one is annihilation, uh, the other is the apocalypse. Uh, but I have to pray that we make the right choice. Right, well, I don't believe that, right? And uh, there are moments in history where there are choices to be made. Um, and uh, the, his, the book is really about the progressives that forced America to make the right choice. Um, if this was January of 1960, when Eisenhower was the president, right, and you read the mainstream press, you read the Times, Newsweek, Harper's, The Atlantic, uh, The New York Times, uh, every major publication, uh, people were bemoaning the fact that, uh, uh, that America was becoming so conventional, and America, uh, the young people were indifferent to idealism, and uh, America was moving in a, in a direction of more conservatism. And then, literally a month later, four students at North Carolina a and University in Greensboro, North Carolina, you know, took over the, uh, the, the lunch counter at the Woolworths <laughs> and had the first sit-in. And the next day, more came back, and the next day, more came back. And within a month, there were sit-ins in 50 cities throughout the South. And then Ella Baker, the great, union, uh, the great uh, civil rights organizer, who's in my book, uh, talked to all these students from these 50 different uh, cities around the South and said, you need to pull together a movement, you know, an organization to make to, to sustain the momentum of the city movement, or else it will disappear, unlike Occupy Wall Street. Mm -hmm. And so she organized a conference at Shaw University in April of 1960 that was the founding convention of SNCC, right, which then created the second wave of the new civil rights movement, which was responsible for many of the great laws that have made America more integrated and racially just society, despite the fact that we have a long way to go. We're certainly not where we were in 1960. Well, what happened? You know, how did that happen? Uh, it happened because these four students decided to get off their asses, and Ella Baker was smart enough to figure out how to pull it together. Right? I believe that this, there are people in this room and in this country like those four students, and there are people like Ella Baker with a lot of organizing experience, some of them are in this room, who can make that happen again. So whenever we despair, remember that my book and American history is full of stories like that. 
And mm -hmm. our children and grandchildren will look back at Occupy Wall Street and whatever's going to happen next around the foreclosure issue, around the unemployment issue, around the student debt issue, which is going to create, I think, the new student movement of the, of the next generation will be around student debt. I think all these things are bubbling below the surface. Um, and if we despair or we don't understand that movements happen behind our backs sometimes, um, and that history can't be predicted, it can only be made, then I think we, uh, we come out of uh, the despair and we become more understanding that movements take time, that history uh, isn't in one direction, but that ultimately, as Bill ended, uh, his talk and what Martin Luther King said that the you know the arc of history bends towards justice, but what Martin Luther King didn't say is somebody has to bend it. <laughs> <laughs> We're the people that have to bend it. <laughs>